I would like to talk about the Metroid properties that hold for almost all Metroids. And if we talk about the almost all graphs, then it's natural to think of the random graphs. But because there is no successful model of random Metroids yet, the arguments being used here will be basically countings. I assume some familiarity with the basic Metroid ter terminology and axioms, and this will be a quick reminder for the terms being used here. A Metroid is defined on a finite ground set with a collection of subsets called independent sets, and this set system is called a Metroid if these three axioms hold. So the independent set must be well, the empty set must be independent, and all the subsets of an independent set must be also independent. And if we have two independent sets with differing sizes, then the smaller independent set must be extendable using an element of the other larger independent set. Because of this last axiom, every maximal independent set must have the same size, and this size is called the rank. And these maximal independent sets are called the bases. Because of the second axiom that independence is hereditary, a metroid is completely determined if we specify which sets are the bases. On the other hand, we can define a metroid based on the set of bases if n, the criterion for deciding whether a certain collection defines a metroid, is described using these two axioms. The first one is trivial and the second one is called the base exchange axiom. And what it states is that if we have two bases and if we take out one of the elements on one side, then there must be another element on the other side so that by exchanging this element with the other, we can find another basis. On the opposite side, we can define a metroid using the dependent set. And a set is called dependent if it is not independent. Since all the subsets of independent sets are independent, if we have a dependent set, then all the, su all the subsets containing the dependent set must be also dependent. Therefore, just like the bases, we can define a metroid only using the minimal dependent sets, and these minimal dependent sets are called circuits. A canonical examples of metroids can be found using graphs and matrices. And if we use the graph, the corresponding matroid has a ground set as the edge set. And in this case, the circuits are precisely the cycles of the graph. So if we think about the independence, then the independent sets must not have any cycles. In other words, they are acyclic graphs or forest. So the maximal ones are the spanning trees if the graph is connected. If we start from matrices, then we we choose the columns to be the ground set. And in this case, the independency is precisely the linear independency between the columns, column vectors. In such cases, the matrix is called representable over the field where over which the matrix is written. In fact, the matrix the metroid is precisely the structure where we can apply the greedy algorithm. And to understand the metroids in the context of computer science, like when we consider the problems like computational complexity of metroid algorithms, then it's natural to hope for a polynomial sized encoding of metroids. Because to describe a polynomial algorithm, we need a polynomial in polynomially bounded input size, so there we need a polynomial, polynomial size encoding of matrix. So the graphs and matrix representations we, we saw previously 
are nice examples of such representations, but we cannot hope such an encoding for all matroids because simply there are too many of the matroids. To describe why there are such a huge number of matroids, let me introduce the class, special class of mat matroids called paving. So we fix the ground set and the rank R, then, well, by specifying the rank, we are saying that the bases have the size R. Then the remaining R sets are called non-bases. The simplest type of matroid is called uniform matroid, and this is the case when there are absolutely no non-bases in our matroid. In other words, because there is no non-bases, every R set is a basis, which means that every subset of size up to R is independent. On the other hand, every subset of size larger than R are dependent, and in this case, the circuits are precisely all the subsets of size R minus 1. If we relax this condition by just a little bit, by allowing the circuits of size R, then the corresponding matroid is called paving. You're assuming the rank is R, right? In the last yeah. line, right? Yes. To show that there are such a large number of paving matroids, I would like to use the characterization of sparse paving matroids by Donald Knuth. So to do so, I need to define the dual matroid. And we have, let me say that we have a matroid with ground set E with the set of bases. Then the dual matroid is defined on the same ground set and its bases are precisely the complements of bases of the original matroid. Then, given this dual concept, a matroid is called sparse paving if the matroid itself and its dual are both paving matroids. Now we can describe Knuth's characterization given in 1970 using the non-bases of a sparse paving matroid. So let's say we have a collection of R sets in our ground set, then this collection becomes the set of non-bases of a sparse paving matroid. If and only if we can, well, there are no two sets in our collection whose symmetric difference becomes size two. So the proof is quite simple and straightforward. So can you, can you give one example where a uh, matroid is paving but not sparse paving? I don't see... Yeah, well... Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there are examples, but mm -hmm. not so many. For small matrices, for small matrices, they are always sparse paving. And for graphing matrices, I suspect that they are always sparse. They are always paving. So, well, yeah. Let me tell you later. So I'm going to prove this characterization and. Firstly, let me assume that we have a matroid which is sparse paving and S is the collection of non-bases and for contradiction, let me assume that there are two elements in our set, our collection whose intersection is precisely R minus 2. R minus 1. Then if we consider the set S1, then this has size R, but it's not a basis, so it must be dependent. And because our matrix is paving, all the circuits have size at least R. So a dependent set of size R must be itself a circuit. Or 
On the other hand, if we take the complement of S2, then again, this is a spot paving matroid. So M star is also a paving matroid. But this set has size n minus r, which is not a basis in the dual. So it must be dependent. And again, because of the paving property, it's also a circuit of the dual matroid. Then a well-known property of the matroids states that a circuit and the circuit of the dual matroid cannot intersect at one element, but these two have intersection precisely intersection at precisely one point. So let's say this is S1 and this is S2, then well they intersect at this point. So these two pairs make a contradiction to the property of the matroids and the contradiction is because of our choice, so there are no such pairs in the collection. So this proves one of the directions. And to prove the other direction, we are starting from such a collection and we need to show that there is a spot paving matroid whose non-basis non form this collection, this precise collection. So what we need to do is that, starting from this collection, we need to construct a matroid and show this is a paving matroid. So because this our collection S is to be the set of non-bases, we are going to say that the remaining sets The remaining R sets so we are trying to show that this set is the set of bases of a matroid then what we need to do is to test the base exchange axiom for this set and to do so we take two sets in our collection whose intersection is precisely r minus 2, so there are two elements outside. These two are from outside of S. And we remove one of the elements, and we need to show that either this set or this set is again outside of S. But the property, intersection property, is equivalently saying that every R minus 1 set is contained in at most one set in our collection. And because this, these two sets, well, this set has size R minus 1, one of these two must not be in S, so that we can immediately verify the base exchange axiom. So, so far, we found that this definition defines a matroid. Which one? Which one? Which one? Okay. So what we need to show is that either this set or this set is outside S, or they are con one of them is contained in this set, but. This condition, what this condition says is that, well, in terms of the intersection, this will never become r minus 1 or less than r minus 1. So that if there is a r minus 1 set, then it is contained in at most one of the sets in S. So, if we take this r minus 1 set, then it is contained in at most one element in S. So we are choosing two r sets 
containing this r minus 1 set. So at most one of them, one of these two can be in S, and the other must not be in S. And what we are going to show is exactly this property, so that it verifies the basic exchange axiom. So what is left is to prove that this matroid is paving. And to do so, it is enough to show that every R minus 1 set is independent. We choose an arbitrary R minus 1 set. And because we assumed R is less than N, there are at least two elements of the ground set outside this R set. And again, by the same logic, either this or that must be not in S so that this R minus 1 set is a subset of a basis, one of these two, and then this becomes independent so that it verifies the paving property. To show this past paving, we need to show also for the dual matroid, but the intersection property is preserved for the dual matroid so that we can apply the exactly same logic with differing numbers, and then we obtain the characterization. So now we characterized the sparse paving matroid in terms of this intersection, well, a certain collection of subsets with intersection property. And this intersection property can be naturally represented, nat naturally represented if we use the Johnson graph. The Johnson graph takes two parameters, the ground set size and the rank counterpart. Its vertices are the R sets of the ground set, and well, the adjacency is defined if and only if their symmetric difference is two or the intersection has size R minus one. Therefore, if you think about the previous characterization, then between two non bases, the adjacency never happens, which means that the non basis of a sparse paving matroid is precisely an independent set in the Johnson graph. So that is, to count the number of spots paving matroids, it is enough to count the number of independent sets in our Johnson graph. Despite the nice algebraic properties of Johnson graph, finding an independent set is never an easy task, but we can find a decent lower bound in a, well, relatively effortless way. The strategy here is to find a large independent set and take all the subsets of this large independent set. To find a large independent set, we consider a prop coloring with few colors. But there is a canonical coloring of this Johnson graph where we assign a set with a color that is uh, the sum of elements, yep, the sum of each element module n then it is easy to check that this is indeed a proper N coloring. So if we take the largest color class, then we can find an independent set of size, this number. And by taking all the subsets, we can find immediately this many independent sets in the Johnson graph, and also the sparse paving matroids on N with rank R. Since the binomial coefficient is maximum at half n, at rank half n, we take r to be half n, and then the number becomes, using the Stirling's approximation, we have some constant times, which is a double exponential number, double exponential function with respect to n. Therefore, if we have an encoding of all matroids, then to distinguish all these matroids, we need at least exponential number of bits. So therefore, to talk about the matroid algorithms, we need to be really careful in restricting the class so that 
uh, polynomial encoding exists. So, so far we saw some evidence of the prevalence of paving matroids, and this was firstly speculated when Blackburn, Kuiper, and Hicks in 1969 or 70 enumerated all the labeled matroids up to eight elements. The prevalence was also confirmed when Gordon Royal extended the enumeration up to nine elements in 2010, around that time. And then in 2011, Dominic Welsh formalized this prevalence by stating this strong conjecture that here we have the ratio of the sparse paving matroids on n elements divided by the matroids on n elements, all the matroids on n elements, and then the ratio tends to 1 as n increases. So in the statement, in the text, I'm stating that all the matroids are paving, but if it's true, then almost all matroids have also dual paving matroids. So almost all matroids must be sparse paving, so they are equivalent statements. Now we have a lower bound of SN in such a way that, well, like this. And to find an upper bound, this is a really trivial upper bound in the sense that recall that our matroid is completely defined by its set of bases. The set of bases of a rank R matroid is a subset of n choose R. So this is a subset of the power set. Well, yeah, there are this many choices to fix the basis set. Therefore, by summing up this number from for all the possible ranks, this is clearly less than n times So that we obtain the lower bound, upper bound for Mn, and we can oversimplify the question by taking double logarithms, and then this becomes and the upper bound becomes n minus some negligible terms. So that when we divide, they they becomes equal. So to improve this, to take out one of the logarithms take, took a while, and then, and also a lot of arguments, and it was finally published in 2014, but their idea was to use the flat cover to find a nice Metroid encoding. A Metroid flat is Obtained a minimal flat containing a set is obtained when we add all the elements without increasing the rank in the sense that if we start from the prism and we are to find the minimal flat containing this set, then what we are going to do is that we take the connected components of our set and then we take the induced subgraph for each of the connected components. In this way, we are not increasing the rank, but to obtain the flat containing this set. This operation is also called closure for obvious reasons. And this flat can be use useful in some cases to decide dependency of other sets. To be specific, if we are given a flat with its rank, then in certain cases, we can decide whether a, another set x is dependent if this inequality holds. What that means is that x contains a certain set whose rank is, whose rank is certainly less than the intersection size. So that subset of x must be dependent and therefore x itself is dependent. In such cases, we call this pair of a flat and its rank covers x. 
and to define a matroid, it is enough to cover all the non-bases by taking certain flat and it, their length. So their idea is that there are usual well if you choose a non-basis, then there are small local local covers in the sense that we can find two flats and most two flats such that if we have a non-basis then each all of the non-basis neighboring non-basis in the Johnson graph are covered by these two flats because the degree of this vertex in the Johnson graph is r and minus r and in the substantial cases we saw that the important cases are when r is close to n half then this is more like n square so we can compress the information contained in this many vertices into only two flats So using these local covers, they were also combining it with the independent set enumeration algorithm developed by Noga Alon, and then it was essentially like finding a large stable set to cover a large portion of the Johnson graphs, and so that there is a small remaining part and the information around this table set is compressed and then this uncompressed amount of information is quite comparable, comparably small to the remaining so that a matroid can be described by a stable set which corresponds to the sparse paving matroid and then the additional amount of information from the flat covers and the remaining is, is confined to a single exponentially bounded function, some polynomial of n. Then by taking the logarithm, we take out this and we know that this is a double exponential function so that this is the dominating term, and uh, well, the ratio becomes one. So we saw some evidence as why people believe that this Welsh's conjecture might be true. And if it is indeed true, then almost all matroids must have the properties that the paving matroids have and these proper, there are some interesting properties because of their simple structures. Now we are going to look at these individual properties. So the paving matroids have quite concentrated rank in the sense that the, their rank is almost surely around and half. So again, if we think about the Johnson graph, then the Johnson graph has the maximum order when r is around, well, yeah, the absolute maximum is around at n half, or if n is odd, these two numbers. It is actually easy to see that almost all matroids on n have rank between just off the half n or a little bit more than half n. For example, if we are going to show that a matroid, well, a matroid rank is almost surely between one third of n and two third of n, then we can bound the number of matroids of rank up to this number by the simple counting we used before. That, yeah, the number is at most to the n choose r where r is up to n third 
So I'm counting the matrix of rank less than this number, less than or equal to this number. Then this is less than n times And again, by solving the approximation, this is about two times which is around 1.89n. Whereas, if we think about the sparse paving matrix with rank half n, then there are at least this number of matrix path paving matrix, which is more or less similar to some constant times. So this is asymptotically larger than this function. So that if we think about only the path paving matrix of rank and half, then it's much larger than all the matrix up to rank one third n. The other side is the dual of these matrix, so we are multiplying only by two, so yeah, the tendency does not matter, does not alter. And this argument can be applied directly sh to show that we can replace the one third by any arbitrary constant less than one half. Welsh posed a stronger version of this conjecture that, in fact, a matrix rank is almost surely precisely half n, or if n is odd, these two numbers. And using the previous matrix encoding, the, those two people have improved this bound to show that the interval can be restricted to, well, reduced to a square root of n. But to show the Welsh's conjecture, to prove Welsh's conjecture, probably it is essential to prove that indeed only for, even for the sparse paving matrix, for the sparse paving matrix, actually the rank This is not the right one. Yep. So the fact is that we do not even know whether even for the sparse paving matrix, almost all of them have rank precisely n half. So this is again involved with finding the number of independent sets in the Johnson graph quite to the extent of quite precisely. So what we do not know yet is whether This set has more independent sets than this. So this is not yet known, so we are kind of far from proving the Welsh's conjecture. The second property is about the matroid connectivity. And for graphs, well, using the random graphs, they are well, well known to be high, arbitrarily highly connected almost surely. But the matroid connectivity is a little bit different from the graph connectivity, and it is defined using a parameterized separations. So using this definition of the connectivity, it is quite easy to see that paving matroid have high, arbitrarily high connectivity, almost surely. But for matroids, if there is a small circuit, then by putting one side to be the side to be the circuit and taking the remaining we can find a small separation of the sides so that by weakening the high connectivity conjecture we can state another conjecture that for any fixed k almost all matrices have no no small circuits of sm size smaller than k Regarding the connectivity conjecture, James Oxley showed that almost all matroids are three connected, and it immediately follows that almost all matroids have no small circuits of size less than three. 
That means almost all matroids have no loops or co loops or parallel elements or co circuits of size 2. So they are simple and co simple, but the argument cannot be easily generalized for larger connectivity, so we are still far from obtaining the high connectivity. But I believe that we can somehow prove, we can, clo we can get closer to proving this no small circuit conjecture if we can prove these two seemingly obvious statements. So again, the essential part is when the rank is around n half. And I would like to prove that this is about the independent sets in, jo in the Johnson graph. And if we have an independent set, then probably the next Johnson graph has an independent set of size, similar size. Second property, second statement, is to combine two smaller Johnson graphs. And then maybe you can find another independent set of size, well, combining these two sets. So if we can prove these two questions seemingly from the design theory, then probably we can prove the small circuits of size. No small circuit conjecture. So now we are at the third and the last property of, well, conjectured property of the sparse paving matroids. And to do so, I need to define what is a matroid. So uh, when x is a proper non empty set, the deletion of x or the restriction to the other side is a matroid defined on the outside of x, where the independency is directly inherited from the original matroid. The contraction is defined as taking dual, removing, and then taking dual back. So, well, if you think about the graphic matroids, then these two operations correspond to coincide with the deletion and contraction of edges in the base graph. And the matrix obtainable using this deletion and contraction are called the minors. Well, suppose also a uh, rather bold conjecture in, the case, in this case that if we fix an arbitrary sparse paving matroid n, then almost all matroids have n as a minor. But the evidence that's found so far indicates that this is probably not true. But if true, then we take n to be the vamos matroid, which is the which is a sparse paving matroid on eight elements with rank four. Then almost all matroids have the vamos matroid as minor, but the property one of the properties of vamos matroid is that is it's not representable over any field, so that almost all matroids are not representable over any field given that versus conjecture is true, or true when at n is a vamos matroid. So to list all these three conjectures in the order of decreasing difficulty, the first one is about arbitrary sparse paying matroid, and the second one is for the vamos matroid, a special case, and the third one is about the representability. If we fix the field in the third conjecture to be any fixed finite field, any finite field, then let's say we have a color field on nine uh, Q elements. 
Then a rank R matroid must have a representation with n columns and r rows, so that there are only two to the n, two not two but q, to the n r different representations, and this is a single exponential function of n, more like q to the n square. And then this is clearly less than the sparse pavement matroid we saw before, which is around this. So that, by simple counting, we can show that for a given finite field, there are much more sparse paving matroids than the matroids representable. And it is uh, <coughs> quite sophisticated to show that almost all matroids are not representable when we fix another, another field whose characteristic is zero, or just an arbitrary field. But that is also true, but we do not know yet whether this third conjecture is true. But for the first conjecture, there are some known properties that the statement is true for certain matroids that it's true for uniform matroids with rank 2 or all the sparse paving matroids up to 6 elements except this graphing matroid which corresponds to the complete graph on, K, on four vertices. Well, yeah. So, for this matroid, this particular matroid, we do not know yet whether the first conjecture is true or not, but it is known that there are many sparse paving matroids that have that does not have this as minor. And what it actually shows is that we took a color class of the Johnson graph. And if n is odd, then every sparse paving matroid in this color class does not have this matroid as a minor. So it indicates that probably even if it is true, there are quite a large number of sparse paving matroids without this minor. And it is likely to me that the first conjecture might be false for arbitrary fixed sparse paving matroids. But to show the non-representability, the vamos matroid will be enough, or by showing the fano and non fano matroid or their dual must be enough. So these were what I prepared for today, and thank you for your attentions.